You're listening to Body IO FM with your hosts, Kiefer and Dr. Rocky, where cutting edge science meets the razor's edge of health and performance. Welcome, everybody, to another episode of Body IO FM with your host, Kiefer, and co host, Dr. Rocky. Hello, Kiefer. <laughs> We've uh, we've got a, a pretty big conference call, so there might be a little bit of <laughs> choppiness in this uh, broadcast, so everybody knows. Because not only is Rocky remote, uh, but we also have the entity known as Everyday Paleo on the show, which is Jason Seib and Sarah Fragoso. Mostly Sarah Fragoso. <laughs> <laughs> well, I notice I notice she she has claim to. Uh, to that Skype, basically some, some, uh, rights to that. Apparently you got bucked, Jason, you have to use a personal one. The site was hers for a lot longer than, than I've been involved. Uh, Sarah actually is the, is the, the famous part of it all. I kind of came in and brought a bunch of muddled science and cost her a bunch of fans. (laughs) Yeah. I just, I couldn't, handle the droves of people so i needed jason to come along and scare some away so it was a little more right. manageable <laughs> perfect that's a good synergism so yeah, it yeah worked out it, great. it worked out yeah. well yeah. It worked out well yeah that's pretty much what i've done yeah, for definitely. rocky i think i've gotten rid of some of his patients that he didn't really <laughs> I, like I was gonna anyway. say it sounds like a very similar relationship john <laughs> wait did you seriously just call me john <laughs> he did i don't know why why I would you do that out that way it just seemed like the right thing to say at that point in time. It's kind of weird, though, huh? It's kind of yeah, like uh, it's kind of like when my wife calls me by my nickname, which she never calls me by. It just seems wrong, huh? Yeah. I was gonna yeah. say my dad is John, and like I was like, what? My dad's on this call? What? What's <laughs> happening? And my husband is too, but I don't ever call him that either. It's I, I usually call him by his last name. Is that weird? Uh, it's, a little, <laughs> it's a little odd. <laughs> <laughs> just check in. But that okay. was your, your family's like a sports team. You're like the coach. You're like, Fergoso, get it's, in there. <laughs> it's totally what it's like. <laughs> it's completely how it is. <laughs> That's funny. Yeah, I actually made my wife call me by my last name, so she didn't have a ch- uh, an option. So that just goes to show there is no appropriate context where it's okay to call me by my first name. Okay, yeah, Rocky. Perfect. <laughs> okay. <laughs> He's been reprimanded. Yeah. <laughs> Poor Rocky. Well, of all the people, he should know this. So <laughs> I got to I- the- challenge the system every once in a while, right? No. Just, just, to, re- <laughs> just to reaffirm. <laughs> we'll just say no. <laughs> uh, and I forgot to mention oh, Highly gosh. Athletic Wear because we started talking right away. But uh, they sponsor the show. Great clothing. Um I know Jason, you got some stuff. I don't know if you were nice enough to give any to to Sarah or not, but I they only gave me a shirt, and the the craziest thing is is that I'm wearing it right now. I and I'm that's not a lie. I I uh, right before this this podcast, I just took a shower and grabbed that shirt without even thinking about it, and I didn't even realize they were a sponsor of your podcast. Oh, yep, yep. So great. Uh, we've even got yeah. an, an unintentional plug on the show. So there you go. Really good stuff. Yeah, great, great clothing. So I, you know, I don't want to go in. I, everybody always asks what everybody does on podcasts and hopefully everybody knows what you two do. So we're just going to skip over that and jump into the conversation. If that works for everybody. Yeah. Sounds good to me. I, I love it. Okay, good. So, you know, everybody like, it, it's funny, even though I have an audience in all these, these different areas like CrossFit, even though I don't like CrossFit, uh, paleo, even though I don't like paleo. Uh, you know, there, there are obviously aspects that are good and, you know, that are salvageable, but a lot of them have, have things that I strongly disagree with, which is one reason I have such a hard time getting sponsors uh, and don't want them because I want to be able to basically trash anything if I, if I, if it comes down to it. Uh, so, you know, I kind of wanted to talk about, um, well, let's start with something that's all the rage right now. And that's like the calories in calories out thing. Have you guys been following that online? Oh God, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's it's kind of been like the the rage for a while. I feel like that's you know that's what everybody talks about, and um, I I actually kind of live in a little like my own little bubble, so I try not to pay too much attention. <laughs> but 
Um, but yeah, it's definitely hard to ignore, unfortunately. I, I feel like, you know, I mean, the majority of what we do is fat loss stuff. And I feel like, you know, at the end of the day, calories are going to count, but they're just not something that, that we address first. There's just so many other things that, that I want a client, you know, somebody comes to me, says, look, I, I really need to lose some fat. There's just so many things that, that need to be addressed first. And I feel like that the huge majority of the time, the calories solve themselves. You get people eating good whole foods, healthy foods. They're eating, you know, they're controlling their carbohydrates. They're eating, um, you know, healthy sources, healthy natural sources of protein and fat. Um, you get, you get satiety out of that. In most cases, it's better than what people had in the past. And I feel like I, uh, if we take a snapshot of calories, it's because usually we're talking about a female client and they're not eating enough. They're eating, you know, something like, uh, a thousand to 1400 calories a day and they're doing a bunch of cardio and they're actually gaining weight because they're just doing more damage to themselves and, you know, creating a body that wants to hoard fat and slow down its metabolism. And you've written extensively about that Kiefer. Um, but it, I can't remember the last time I had to tell somebody I, you need to start cutting your calories back. That just seems like it comes out in the wash. And if I'm mentioning calories, I'm, I'm saying, you know, and Jim Laird has, has said the same thing. Clients come into us, female clients come into us. They're not eating enough to, to have a healthy metabolism and metabolism repair is really what fat loss is about. Yeah. And you said something key there that I think convolutes the conversation a lot. And that's that, you know, this idea of they're not eating enough calories, they're exercising a lot and they're gaining the weight back. And, you know, what we're really saying there, just like when we say we want to lose weight, we want to lose fat. And, you know, that that's the kind of the confusing point. People hear that and be like, oh, that's impossible, blah, blah, blah. But, you know, really the the point is you're not gaining weight back, you're gaining back fat and at the cost of muscle. So you're recompositioning your body. And I, I think that's right. a lot of what confuses people out there and confuses the layperson and that people, you know, who like to troll for this kind of thing, that's what they rely on. They rely on somebody uh, misspeaking or saying something that's not clear and say, oh, well, that's impossible. Obviously, it's it's stupid. It's It's not. What we're saying is you don't gain the weight back. You start gaining body fat back. And that's at the expense mm -hmm. of muscle mass. So you're making yourself more unhealthy and we have examples of that. There's examples of that in the literature. Uh, many people have seen it experientially. You know, they've seen it happen to themselves or friends or clients. So, you know, I think part of the part of the real issue we have here is just the language that we use when we talk about this. And I, I think it confuses yeah. a lot of people. Oh, it does. Yeah. I mean, the information that's out there is so convoluted. I think it's really just hard for people to understand where to begin and who to believe or what to believe. And people are fearful of self-experimentation. Like they're afraid, like, well, maybe I just need to start here and then figure it out for myself where they're looking for a set of rules. And it's, it's really challenging for a lot of people, really, really challenging. You know, I think one of the issues as well in the uh, calories in calories out camp is it's such a rigid kind of view of things. There's no real um, openness to looking at any of things, or if it, there is, it's not really being, um, promoted, right? So they're, mm -hmm. they're promoting this single concept, um, and everything else is stupid. And, um, I think what Jason said is really, I think really valuable in terms of things typically will iron themselves out, you know, once you start eating foods that are going to be more healthier for you. Um, and then there are going to be those odd people, um, that might need to look at them cutting back intake, depending on what the results are getting. So I, I think that's a really smart approach, to be honest with you. I mean, we see that all the time here in the office. And I, I see patients coming to me who are yo-yo dieting and doing very low calorie programs. So maybe they're doing like the, the like an HCG program where they're only eating 500 calories a day. Ugh. and They lose all this weight and then they, then they gain it all back plus another 10 or 15 and then, you know, not only are they uh, more unhealthier and have a higher percentage of body fat, but psychologically there also is a huge issue with that as well too. So they're just yeah. devastated because, you know, it, it's, which, a, it's a vicious cycle. Which ends up being the bigger issue in the end. That just getting over yeah. that programming is really, really hard. And, you know, we have clients in the gym where it's like, this is where we start. We don't even look at their movement. <laughs> <laughs> 
we start first with under that you have to eat. <laughs> and it's it's very hard to reprogram people who have been through that yo-yo dieting. Yeah, and most people don't even know yeah, the history sort of, a- of our – oh, I, I was going to say most people don't even know the history of the calorie. You know, at water, you know, it – um, one of the biggest studies ever done, and it's never been repeated. He looked at 10,000 people in calorimet- uh, in calorimetry studies to try to get at how many calories each of these nutrients give us and in combination with each other, uh, which I think is a key point. And he had values that were ranging way across the board. You know, fat ranged between 7 and 11. Uh, protein ranged between 2 and a little over 4. You know, carbohydrates had a range. So he just averaged everything. You know, he had some actually pretty good data showing that people run at different efficiencies at different times and with different diet makeups. And at the time, the best he could do is just average it. So even the the values we have aren't reliable for anything. And, and that's why I think it's great you guys don't start there with calories because it's it's this big 10,000 foot view number. Mm-hmm. Gives us some idea of what's going on, but it really can't tell us anything specific. Yeah, and we're just not closed systems, you know. Like we're, we're in this, and that argument's been made a thousand times. That acting like that first law of thermodynamics is it applies to us is like saying that we're you know bomb calorimeters, and that's just a ridiculous concept. I mean, we we respond differently to various different types of food. So just to act like all food is the same, count it up, put it into a body, and expect results would be, the, you know, that whole five reduce your calories by by uh, by five hundred and your you know what is it your thirty five hundred calories of of uh, in a pound of human body fat. So if you re- reduce your cal- caloric intake by five hundred calories a day, you should lose a pound a week. And I mean that has never worked like that for anybody ever. Like I don't, I just don't even know if there is a human on the planet that could say that they have consistently been able to make that math work. Yeah. And, and the, the first law of thermodynamics actually says nothing really about human beings and how they're going to use the food for, you know, a big system. Not only are we an open system, we're far from equilibrium. So, you know, what we need to look at is the second law of thermodynamics, which tells us uh, what do we do with that food? How is it incorporated into the body? What type of tissue is it going to be partitioned into uh, what's more likely scenario? How much are we going to absorb? How much is going to come out the other end? Uh, what is our metabolism doing? Which reactions are more likely? Uh, what compensations do we have to make because we didn't get enough of one nutrient or over another? I mean, there's all these things that you have to look much, much, much deeper to answer those questions. And the first law of thermodynamics literally says nothing other than that, yes, at some point, energy balance is going to matter, but we can't, we can't put a number on that. Say you give somebody, somebody 10,000 calories diet and a lot of it's oil. Well, that's going to come out the other end. They're not necessarily going to gain weight on a 10,000 calorie diet because they ingested a lot of oils. That's just like, you know, cleaning them out. It's like an oil enema, except it's going in the mouth (laughs) instead of the other end. Um, you know, and, the first law Sounds of like thermodynamics. Great plan. Sign me up. <laughs> <laughs> well, I actually, I had a friend who decided he was going to do carb night, but he was only going to do it with protein powder and flaxseed oil. Oh dear God! <laughs> I know. And then he tells me, he goes, "Well, the diet doesn't work because I started, you know, having leaks while I was driving my car." I'm like, "Who told you to do flax oil and protein powder? When, what made you uh-huh. think that was a good idea?" And right. you know, the- yeah. right? Well, it's yeah. <laughs> mm-hmm. We have lots of stories like that from our perspective too, like why this paleo thing doesn't work when they're eating everything that they're supposed to on the paleo diet, although it all looks like cookies and cupcakes from morning to night. So and yeah, no. and bread. Right. Yeah. Yep. So let, well, let's let's push into that arena of uh, what's going on with paleo now. I saw what was it called? Coco- coconut flakes or something like that. It's like paleo approved breakfast cereal that's got like cane sugar and coconut flakes it's absolutely got no grains in it yeah i I saw somebody sent me a picture of it i was like oh that's awesome they're like paleo approved so (laughs) paleo is a mess right now and i I we we were just talking about this and i just don't i don't know that i don't know that we are forever going to be able to to to, uh fly the the paleo banner the way we do now at least i mean the the idea of um, 
of evolutionary biology being a good a, a good kind of base point, a good overarching theory for the way you eat and move and sleep and manage your stress is sound. It's a totally sound um, concept. And and when we do that and we say, okay, where did we step off the path in our process of natural selection? Then let's take that stuff in the lab. Don't immediately vilify it and say, well, cavemen couldn't do this, so it's, it's bad. Take it you know, in the lab and look close and look at what's happening to, to people on an anecdotal level and an epidemiological level. And, you know, I mean, that 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 all makes perfect sense to me, and it's never not going to make sense to me. There's always that that argument. You know, you wouldn't take a, a tiger out of the jungle, throw it in, the, in a cage, and feed it 40% of its natural diet, stand back and wait for it to turn into a peak specimen of tiger health, and that makes perfect sense to everybody. But we do have to follow the science, and I know you've argued that grains aren't as bad as what everybody says they are, and you know now there's some argument that maybe there it's the the, the uh, FODMAPs and the grains and not the the gluten that's causing the problem. When we take grains away from people. But right now where I stand, when we take grains away from people, we dramatically lower their processed carbohydrate intake. There isn't really any grains that aren't you know, technically not processed because there's nobody standing in a, in a, in a uh, field of grains right now harvesting them and eating them. They've got to at least be milled. So, uh, you know, we're not hurting anybody on that front, and, um, and we appear to be doing a lot of people good. But when we're going to start making this into a diet and saying the rules of paleo are a b and c take whatever you can and make it fit inside those rules and then ignore everything else when it comes to exercise sleep and stress management and um you know a genie will pop out of your rear and grant your wishes this is a ridiculous concept and the the paleo community is so broken and like sarah said convoluted right now because everybody wants to make this a diet. We were just talking about earlier today. If you walked up to somebody and asked them what the Atkins diet was or the zone diet, you would get a very short list of rules on, you know, things to eat, things not to eat, macronutrient ratios, whatever. And people have tried to do that with this, this theory of evolutionary biology and applying that to eating and living and creating healthy humans. And I had somebody on my Facebook the other day, tell me straight up that paleo required eating more than 60% vegetables. And I was like, what in the holy hell? Where did this come from? Like, Rob Wolf has never said this. Mark Sisson has never said it. Chris Kresser has never said it. I mean, like, this is what it gets distilled down to is these, these sound bite rules, and those will never work in any overarching, entirely encompassing uh, model of health. They just, they just won't. And I think a good diet is also always going to unfold in phases and – you know, you're, what you're doing with carbs and macronutrients is, is right on par with what has to be done in the end to get metabolic flexibility back. And, um, you know, I, I, I just, I think that if we just follow the science, we'd all in the someplace better than where paleo is right now. Yeah. And if I can jump in real quick, I mean, I, I, I will say that I feel really grateful for how quickly paleo has grown in one respect that it is definitely helping people be more aware of their health and people are feeling better and it's a great jumping off point. Is it perfect? No, but nothing is. So um, it's a double-edged sword for me because obviously it's built my career. It's changed my life and my health and I will always be a paleo advocate. However, everything, I mean, it, when anything grows, I mean, look at our country, for example, <laughs> there's going to be problems and that's where free thinking and um, self-experimentation and looking at the science comes in. So there are people who will do that. And then there are people who won't, who will, who will, like Jason said, just treat paleo like another diet, which really doesn't work for most people. So grateful. Yes, I am for paleo. It's definitely, you know, I, I feel like it's really helping a lot of people. Um, folks are starting to you know, open their eyes, especially to things that are really near and dear to my heart and I think are super important, like where is your food coming from, um, tr you know, hopefully supporting their local economy, making sure that they're taking responsibility for their own nutrition, doing things like growing gardens, planting their own herbs, um, having chickens, uh, things that are good for our environment. So there's a lot about the movement that's wonderful, but when it comes down to like the science behind it, 
um, which I think is very solid. People just tend to extrapolate from paleo what they want in order to market it rather than what's actually really truly benefiting people. So there's, I think at this point, more good than bad, because my whole goal in this movement is to help people find health, um, which is why Jason and I are trying to have a big voice, because I feel like people are, you know, trying to say what's right and what's good for them, which might not be right and good for everyone. So I think our message is really trying to figure out what is right and good for you in your health and what does your body need to be, need to do to be a healthy human. So that's, that's my whole view on the whole thing. Yeah, I uh, that that's one thing I do like about paleo is the reach and the spread it's had and uh, how it has exactly like you said gotten people to pay attention to their health and really what's going in their mouth. Um, right. But from my perspective, you know, I would see paleo as a very very unscientific diet, uh, only because we we don't know what we ate, you know, through our evolution, and you know, it's based on a premise that we know is flawed. Our genetic code is. Uh, changing much, much faster than we thought. So, you know, you have these people who come up with kind of this imaginary scenario of what we ate and they make some good guesses and they, you know, they use some evidence and we kind of come up with this story and maybe it's a good story, maybe it's not. And then from that story, we kind of use that to throw away everything we do know. We have some really concrete information about carbohydrates and very certain macronutrient profiles but they, they kind of use the story to throw all that away and then, you know, pick and choose, well, not pick and choose, but start to look at science that specifically supports their story and while all the while ignoring all this other great information that we have. So, you know, maybe people do have food allergies, maybe, um, you know, there's allergies to vegetables, but there's no reason to think that we evolved with them in the first place. So there's no reason to think we need to include them in the diet. Um, and you know, there's this focus on grains instead of, well, maybe it's the overall carbohydrate load. Uh, we've got a lot of great science and I feel like too much of the paleo community ignores what we already do know. And instead of layering that on top of, you know, the really good science that we have, the things that are known, the things we don't have to guess about, um, and then moving forward from there, I just feel like there's too much of this trying to really focus on a story of evolution. Uh, n- not that I don't believe in evolution, but that, you know, we, we just don't know what we ate, really. I mean, the best evidence we have says, well, we ate animals and that's about it and not much else. Uh, so from there, what, you know, all, all this other research, you know, focusing on the gut and the microbiota, I think that's, you know, excellent research. I think some great information is going to come out of it. But we also know that if you just fix your diet and you take carbs out of it, even though your bacterial and your, the bacteria in your gut goes down quantity wise, it all shifts to the healthy bacteria. So we've got all this great evidence and it, you know, the weight of it is being ignored because there's this story over here that's taken the main kind of focus. And that's, you know, kind of my issue with paleo. There's some great information there. There's some great minds there. Um, but we're seeing it now. It's like, oh, well, maybe it wasn't gluten and wheat. Uh, maybe it's these FODMAPs. And then what if that turns out not to be true? It's like, oh, well, maybe it's not the FODMAPs. Maybe it's these other chemicals that have reactions in wheat, which there are other candidates. It's like, oh, maybe those that are making everybody sick. Oh, well, it wasn't those. Well, I know it's wheat. I just know it's wheat because that's what the story says. And that, that's the thing that that's kind of where I have that clash with paleo a little bit. Just well, to put my yeah, perspective you know, on it. My, my general, you know, kind of the undertones of this whole thing for me are that we do know that we ate a lot of meat and we do know that eating fibrous vegetables and, um, and, uh, and some starch, you know, some fibrous vegetables and some starch filling in the gaps between the, uh, the meat with the, you know, protein and fat, animal protein and animal fat being the, the, you know, the kind of our go-to source of calories we know that that those those prescriptions right there make people considerably healthier. So, at the end of the day, I don't know that I'm. You know, you're, you're right. Like if if we if the science turns up in in a year that grains are absolutely harmless, I still don't know. I mean, like telling people to not eat them still solves this processed carbohydrate problem in, in a, in a group of foods, instead of telling people to go home and weigh and measure their food. If I tell people to eat meat and fibrous vegetables, 
and then cycle in some starch. We have done, and we do the starch, we do it with like, you know, yams, sweet potatoes, um, white potatoes, white rice, things like that. Technically a grain, I know. But <laughs> these, you know, really, really healthier, pure, sort of pure, more pure forms of starch. And, you know, starch basically being like a, a hairball of glucose under a microscope, just easily, relatively easily dismantled lump of glucose molecules. Um, we get we get this improved health in a situation in which, you know, pe- people are forced to avoid 80, 90% of what's in the middle of their grocery store. Um, you know, uh, the huge majority of those products being made of, you know, uh, corn, wheat, soy, uh, you know, those, those three big cash crops. It, taking those things out, regardless of whether or not we come back around and go, you know, Grains weren't really that big of an issue. Well, when we did start farming these grains, we did get the ability to begin eating a carbohydrate load that's virtually impossible for hunter-gatherers. So, you know, I mean, I agree, but just playing the devil's advocate, like we do do have to have the right science. We do have to be telling people the right things. But if we say, hey, you quit eating bread, pasta, um, you know, cereal and, you know, your oatmeal in the morning, all that stuff, we, we... we, we get to something that much easier that can look like, you know, carb night, for example, and, and all these amazing fat loss results and glucose control come out of it is, can we agree on that much? Well, yeah. So, you know, just really my problem is, so that's a prescription that I came up with almost 15 years ago. Now I wrote the book 10 years ago now, never even considering, um, you know, this, this idea of paleo and grains are dangerous or whatever. And, so I was trying to rely on what we know for sure. You know, what I the, the problem I see with things like paleo and what scares me is you get all this evidence and you show, okay, it, it wasn't grains, it wasn't, you know, wheat. Those aren't as dangerous as we thought, or maybe there's no danger at all for most people. Well, now you've just given fuel to the other side. It's like, well, look how stupid that was. They said all these things and they turned out all all to be wrong. So you should go ahead and eat right. your bread and all this other stuff. It it unfortunately maligns the entire uh, movement of exactly what you're saying, trying to help people get carbs out of their diet because the focus was never on carbs. It was on these grains, um, which might turn out to be really bad science. And if it's bad science, then you're going to have this huge backlash and paleo will be one of those things that fades into the background, which would be, you know, as much problem as I have with paleo, I think that would be a massive mistake uh, to let paleo just die off like that because so it has helped so many people in so many ways. It's brought the environment into the conversation. It's brought the quality of food. It's brought how we, um, you know, even distribute food in this country into question. So there's, there's so many powerful aspects. I would hate to see it fall into this idea of a fad and die away because of a few key points that could have easily been avoided. Yeah, I agree. And I think uh, Sarah and I have talked about this. Why the paleo flag is strong as we do right now, because we will always follow the science. And just since we've been doing this, we've, you know, went from, I mean, when I first started out, I was, I was a diligent paleo warrior. I didn't, I I wanted everybody to cut out all dairy and rice and all this. And, you know, now all of those things are basically back in for me, Uh, white potatoes, starch. I'm like in the, of the opinion that, you know, I think that people actually need starch to a certain degree. It needs to be cycled, you know, like something like what you're doing with, with, uh, with carb night, but there's a reason that we have amylase right in our saliva. And we used to vilify this stuff and act like it was just terrible. And, and then there was the gigantic fish oil prescription that's now been, you know, everybody's sort of rescinded. It, it's, um, it, it follow, if we follow the science, we're going to end up okay. But if we have to say, no, we are in this paleo camp and that's what this means. And you guys are all outsiders. Now we've got our us versus them. You're right. The, the, the changes in the science and the things that we learn as we go will destroy the, the industry. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think you know, that the, the I, 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 sorry. I think the problem. I think- Here, I'll moderate. Rocky, go ahead and then we'll <laughs> save your, hold your thoughts, Sarah, because Rocky doesn't talk very much. So when he does, we, we need to hear it. <laughs> Okay. You know, I, think, <laughs> I think one of the issues will be here is that, you know, you're looking at a way of eating that we're presuming was done, right? We're, you know, like, like Kiefer said, we don't really know exactly what the diet consisted of. 
But then also, I think you have to look at the ability to translate that over time and over generations. And obviously, you know, we're in a completely different environment than we were back then. And so, you know, we can certainly look at some of the basic science concepts and try to translate them and apply them to current current society. But I don't think you'll ever have that true randomized control trial where you can actually say this is what the science says. And I think that um, it's interesting. I, I think that, that unfortunately, although I think initially when paleo kind of was being, um, you know, like when Rob's book came out originally, I, I think that there are a lot of good things uh, that were coming from this. And the problem is, is that it's almost, the, and, and I'm sure you probably agree, the name has been hijacked. Mm-hmm. And, um, and, and I'm looking at, you know, you mentioned this coconut flakes cereal, for example. So I'm on this website and I'm looking at the col- right-hand column here. So they've got coconut white chocolate cake batter spread that's low carb. They've got paleo wraps. I'm like, you know, if I'm thinking about doing a paleo diet, this would be like the farthest thing from the concept of what we would be eating. I mean, it, it, it's just, it's been bastardized almost. And so, so the, the, the message gets lost in, in the marketing, right? And, and, and people get then are now being overly confused. And, and I think that to a certain extent, that's what marketing is all about, right? Let's confuse the, the clientele so we can sell more product. But again, I think that um, you have to look at that translational uh, application of diet. Um, and then you can certainly take some nuggets from what we've seen in the past and then, then taking those nuggets and applying them to a current population and seeing how it reacts. I mean, I, that's the way I would look at it. But I think that some of these things we talked about here in the last 20, 25 minutes are really, I mean, I see this every day in the office. I mean, people come in and trying to do the paleo diet. And like many of us know, that could mean a thousand different diets. Right yeah. at this point in time, I mean, speaking, I guess it's just being muddled. You know? Yeah, go ahead, Sarah. Right, exactly. No, I'm, I only got about half of that because we're we're I'm breaking up or someone's breaking up a little bit. But I just was going to interject and just kind of off the tail end of what Jason just said is I think that the voices in the paleo community who are truly there or here or wherever we are to really help <laughs> people. I, Jason and I both own gyms. We're working with people one on one every single day. We're literally in the trenches. I think our voices will stay strong no matter what happens throughout all of this, because we are willing to morph with the science. And at the end of the day, our true message is to really try and help folks find health and what works for them. Whatever that word is, I don't really care. I just want it to be something that people that resonates with people that makes sense. And that is actually helpful and beneficial, which is why our message, message does change as we learn more as you know we, we experiment with our own clients and with our own bodies and we meet new people like you Kiefer and we continue to expand our horizons and understand you know how we react to certain foods and maybe some people react differently and it's just I think that in the paleo community the voices that are the loudest and the strongest most of those voices fortunately come from folks who really want to truly help others. Um, so, you know, I, I, I'm in it for the duration and for the long haul and in hopes that the outcome for folks who are listening to what Jason and I have to say is that they find their health and they're able to do what they love again. And that's all I really truly care about. And that's why I'm able to sleep at night because I, I don't even know how to market cereal. I don't even, I, I just, <laughs> <laughs> when I started this whole thing, it was so that my clients in the gym would understand that their kids don't need to survive on pop tarts and that they can eat real food. I mean, that was the whole point of this was let's just figure out what the optimal choices are and what works best for your family. And now that I, you know, I'm like the paleo grandma stepping back and looking at how things have changed over the years. It is absolutely mind boggling. If I were just starting trying to figure out what to do for my own health, I, I, I can totally see where the confusion lies. Like it is definitely way different than East years ago when it was just, you know, Rob and Mark and, and little old me trying to, you know, change a few people's lives. So yeah, it's, it's going to be interesting to see how it all plays out, but I don't think Jason and I are going anywhere despite what might happen to the name. <laughs> yeah. I, I think so, that's the nice thing here is, you know, the, the few breakout people have definitely, I think, transcended the name, you know, even though it might be attached to your earlier conversation or, you know, the, the most of the people have transcended that notion of starting in paleo. And I, I think that's great. And I, like you said, Sarah, like you and Rob and Jason and Mark Sisson, really the goal there is to help people and just make them healthy. And 
that that's what I'm worried about causing a backlash where people stop listening. It's like, oh, well, you know, that was a paleo guru. What do they know? And, you know, luckily people are branching out a little bit more and touching more people and touching more organizations. So I think that'll, that'll help prevent that. But, you know, that's kind of my fear is that there, there's so many good things about paleo. Like I said, particularly, I just, I love how paleo has become so focused on local form farming and local agriculture and supporting your local community that way. That's one of the best ways to, you know, provide good quality food for people and avoid some of the distribution processes we have. And I don't think that conversation would be so mainstream if paleo hadn't become so mainstream. So there's great, there's so many great things that have been dragged along with it that I just, you know, for me to lose that in the conversation because, uh, you know, some of the science turns out to be wrong or bad or just misinterpreted, uh, you know, I, I think would be a, a terrible cost. Yeah. And the focus on whole real food, I think has also been a big benefit of paleo. Um, it, you know, just from the psychology side, which is a huge interest to both Sarah and I, I I've done just tons and tons of research on that front and, and, you know, getting people away from some of these hyper palatable manufactured, you know, um, chemist experiments of foods, um, uh, and getting back to stuff that looks like whole real food, you know, meat, vegetables, um, some fruit, uh, just things that look the way that food looks in the, in, in the real world before it's been through, uh, you know, a, a lot of manufacturing and turned into a product per se. I, that, that's another part of the focus that I just don't, I don't regret in any of this. It's the, when we take people from eating things that come, almost exclusively in boxes and bags and, you know, labels with things on it that we can't even pronounce, regardless of whether or not those things come out in a laboratory and we end up proving that this was unhealthy or that was unhealthy or whatever, the relationships with food change. And that's so important. And we discount that stuff way too much. We discount, um, you know, food addiction and, and dopamine and, and the way people chase endorphins and dopamine in their, in the way they eat and exercise and this, this uh, stress relief at the, at the, at the table or, you know, get home from work and have a crappy day. And then suddenly you look around on the couch and you're surrounded by wrappers and boxes and bags of things that you have apparently ingested while you were stressed out. You know, those, those kinds of things need to change. And, and I, I honestly believe wholeheartedly through the, the, the science and the anecdotal evidence I see before me that changing people to a diet that consists of whole real food does the lion's share of that for them. Oh yeah, I totally agree. I mean, I think McDonald's should have to have, should have to put out a YouTube video showing what their burger patties start life as, because it basically comes out of a soft serve <laughs> ice cream machine. It's a pink paste and they have yeah. to add beef flavor to it because there's not enough actual beef in it to produce a beef flavor. If everybody Gross. had to watch that YouTube video or it was playing on the little screen behind the counter at McDonald's, I think it would make a pretty significant difference for at least 50% of the population that goes and eats at McDonald's. Yeah. I think um, you're being generous. <laughs> well, okay, <laughs> maybe only 25%. <laughs> yeah, actually what everyone should do is actually work at McDonald's for a month. Um, believe it or not, I don't think very many people know this about me, but when I was 15, my first job was at McDonald's in Red Bluff, California. <laughs> and um, I, I haven't, yeah. <laughs> That's, all I need That's to awesome. Say. <laughs> Do you have a picture of yourself in the little outfit? Because that would be priceless. You know she, was was <laughs> <laughs> she was 300 pounds. She was 300 pounds and she, and, and she actually, the most of the pictures you see of her now are Photoshopped because she was just huge <laughs> back then. She's never fully recovered. That's right. No, um, actually, you could hardly see me. I don't even think they found a uniform that could really quite fit me. It was like I had to pull my pants up like underneath my bra and it was bad. Yeah. Um, but no, I'll look for a picture and I'll, I'll send one to you, Keeper. You can blackmail me. But no, I yeah, it, good point um, on the McDonald's. Just work there for a month. You'll never feel the urge to want to eat there ever again. <laughs> and for everybody, I, Sarah is a tiny, tiny, tiny little human and and I was making fun of Sarah. If you are 300, I, I, we love, love to help you there. Sorry. Oh, yeah. People people can be sensitive sometimes. Keeper, about maybe you need to um, have a video. 
Go ahead. I said, Kiefer, maybe you need to have a video of the fish fillet being made behind the counter, and that would be more of a deterrent. <laughs> that will not deter me. I will still eat fish fillet once every six months. There's something about the taste there that it's like some kind of crack. I don't know what it is, but... It, it is crack. That's <laughs> what it is. Yeah, I will never forever give up fillet of fish unless McDonald's goes out of business. Which they won't, so I think you'll be good. There's one in every country I've ever been to, so you're solid there. There you go. <laughs> I, um, man, I had a good point and I totally lost it. Thanks, Rocky. We just, we distracted you. Yeah. Oh, well. Um, it was Rocky's fault. Yeah. It's usually Rocky's fault. That's why he doesn't talk very much because I bash him every time he does. Um, <laughs> oh, that's what it was talking about. That's what it was. People who are, you know, who might weigh 300 pounds. Uh, you know, I think they're, they're really sensitive about that because they think there's no solution. You know, it's like being, it's like having a leg amputated there. You're, you don't want to talk about it because there's no way you can really fix it. And I think that's a lot of people feel that way about their body weight, uh, which, you know, is one, you know, one nice thing about a lot of the new kind of diet and health paradigms. If you want to put paleo into that or low carb or whatever, it's usually really easy for people to do those type of prescriptions and see that, they're no longer a slave to their body. And I think that's where that sensitivity comes from is, you know, thinking that you've, you've got no solution, but there's tons of solutions out there. You guys see that in people who come into your facility, like they just, they feel defeated. Yeah. Then talk about this a lot. There's no, in in psychology, they say that, that it's, there's two, two terms. And one of them is they've, you know, they've lost their internal locus of control. And the other one is, um, uh, a term, I think, uh, I think Martin Seligman actually coined it called learned helplessness. And uh, they've, they've done all kinds of research in, in actual on the learned helplessness thing. Um, interesting studies where they yoke animals together. And then, um, you know, so both of them receive a stimulus like a shock, but only one of them has control to fix it. And interesting subjects that we don't have to go all the way deep into. But basically the concept is you give you, – you, you put somebody in a negative situation and show them – that what they thought was control of that situation does not work over an extended period of time. They uh, basically give up. And then even when control is given back to them, they don't really try. Um, They've done studies where they had people in a laboratory and there would be some loud, obnoxious noise that would come out, you know, it hit them real hard at random and they would be able to hit a button and turn it off. And then over time they would make that button less consistent and then they would make it stop working entirely and then they would give them back control and the people would just never try to hit the button again because they had learned that it didn't work anymore and that's kind of what happens in these people um these overweight individuals they you know they've tried this main mainstream prescription because everybody knows that what you do to lose weight is exercise more and eat less and they've done that and they've done that to extremes but they're not fixing the metabolism they're actually getting fatter or at the worst case or at the least the uh, very least they're staying as fat as they as they've always been and and they lose that internal locus of control that tells them I have the power to fix this. And, um, sometimes they'll make attempts again and we'll see those people come into the gym and they just don't really have that internal locus of control or deep down inside, even subconsciously that, um, little voices saying, you know, you've tried this a thousand times and it never works. So I don't know what you're doing now. You might as well just eat that cheesecake. You're going to fail eventually anyway. Um, and, um, it, it really does, it really does a lot of damage that lack of, of, uh, of belief that, that it can be done. Anybody have a you comment? Guys, yeah. Are uh, you guys still there? I lost you. Yeah. I'm here. Yes. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> I put everybody to sleep. Damn. I'm good. Like that's, what's going on everywhere. I go to talk. I look out and everybody's asleep. I just figured it out. I'm really boring. <laughs> oh my gosh. Well, it's that, that, you know, one part of that lifestyle we tell people about is to make sure your sleep's in check. So, you know, you're helping people, you're helping the masses, Jason. <laughs> yeah, I hope so. Right. Did you feel that way, Rocky? I know you had a, I, I don't even know if you tried when you definitely carried, you know, like an extra hundred pounds of body fat. Did you go through that where you tried things or did you even just get to the point where you weren't trying anything? I, I think it goes through cycles because it really depends on the motivation of the individual and then the periods where there is lack of motivation to do the frustration. Well, I'm, of- but I'm talking about you. <laughs> In, in this one, yeah, like, I mean, did you go through this? Oh, I think definitely. I think anyone who, um, 
um, was as big as I was, or if not bigger, goes through all these things. And, um, you know, again, I know I had periods of times where, you know, you get that motivation, something clicks and you say, okay, let's go for it and do it again. And then for whatever reason, it's, you know, again, that, that cycle of, okay, I did okay for a while. And then, you know, you know, you fall off the wagon and then you go back to your old ways. And I think it's the, and I, I certainly had that issue as well in terms of going back to not thinking of the paradigm shift, but thinking of the short-term goal. And um, and again, psychologically, that's really a, a, a hard thing to overcome. Obviously, if it wasn't, we'd have lots of patient people, people that were much healthier than we are now. So, but yeah, I mean, it's always a difficult process because of, and, and I think it's the totality of both the psychology and, you know, probably brain function, that, you know, the way the brain looks at food and appetite and the, you know, your neurotransmitter, I mean, the whole ball of wax, so to speak. So, but yeah, I mean, it's always a, a struggle, you know, even today, it's just a little struggle, right? I mean, for me, at least, I mean, uh, there's always things that make me want to think about going toward, uh, so if I, you know, looking at things that maybe I would want to go and eat that. You know, you know, without a doubt before it'd be like off the hook. And certainly because I've made such progress in the way I've done things on my own with my own self, uh, I think that my ability to you know, control some of those impulses and control some of those mechanisms where maybe I didn't have that self-control before is much greater now. Um, but I think that's, again, a process over time that, you know, you're changing things as you move forward. I don't know if that answered the question or not. Yeah, no, that, that was a pretty good answer. Yeah, I mean, I feel like there's so much that goes into this subject. And, you know, oftentimes, and I know I've been in a similar situation, maybe not so much with a fat loss goal, but just with trying to improve my health in general, where you begin to feel comfortable with being uncomfortable because it's all you know. And there are so many people in the same state. So it's like everybody that you talk to is suffering from similar, if not yet the same situation that you're in, you know, so it's like this community of people who are uncomfortable and it just becomes the norm. So it's, it's really, really hard to change when the majority of our population is, you know, definitely struggling with the same issues and mainstream media is teaching us that there's a quick fix and that it should happen overnight and that everything should be perfect. And you should look like the person on the front of the, you know, the pill bottle you're about to take because you think that that's the answer and it's you know change is really really challenging and especially when it's a change that isn't going to be um fast and we're programmed to think that it's not sustainable so i mean there's just so much that goes into it and of course each person has a different personality and a different story and a different reason and we could just go on and on and on um, but so much of it like jason was saying you know a big part of our job is to get to the psychology of the problem rather than just changing how a person eats so it's it's big, the big issue. Yeah, um, yep, yep. it's in a, a lot of times in a lot of these discussions, I think, especially on the Internet, kind of miss that mental component and they just blame it on. Well, people are too weak willed and it's mm -hmm. it's a lot more complex than that. I mean, I was lucky because the way I grew up and without a lot of friends and, you know, the way I learned to learn, I was just very tenacious. I didn't know what failure meant. If there was a problem, I knew there was a solution and I knew I just had to keep cracking at it and I would eventually succeed. And, you know, luckily that drove me for years and years and years. And I still have that kind of personality, but I know a lot of people don't grow up in environments like that or, you know, with that kind of learning style. And, you know, for a while I actually missed that. I didn't, I didn't realize why people couldn't just instantly start doing what I, I did and why they couldn't just stick with it. It's like, well, you know, if I can do this, why don't you? And I didn't understand that entire psychology behind it, that they had been defeated so many times. They just figured that this was being set up for another round of defeat, which was going to make them feel worse again. Uh, it, you know, I, I never really comprehended that until pretty recently, actually. It can be pretty devastating. You know, I mean, it really uh, um, can hamper your ability to really get the, at the core issues and, and facilitate change. And um, and sometimes it can take a very long time to get over that. Right. I mean, uh, and obviously when you find that patient or that client in that cycle, um, you know, again, it's a matter of just being patient and waiting until they're ready to, to kind of move forward again. Because if you don't, then you're going to set them up for another vicious cycle of failure. Right. 
Yeah, those those uh the take you pull the psychology out of this and all we're doing is just drawing footprints on the ground, but we're not asking who is capable of stepping in them and who isn't. Yep. And I just I'm not I'm not willing to play that game. I, yep. I wanna okay. know why some people succeed and some people don't and it isn't just the information we sell maps we only sell maps to a destination we can't make anybody go there nobody goes from point a to point b with, with anything more than our information on how to get there they have their own reasons for why they, they they erect obstacles in their own path or some things just seem insurmountable to them and those things are very interesting to me because i think the majority are failing even with good information yep true yeah, and and good cookbook. So let's lighten the conversation a little bit and <laughs> and talk about Sarah. You just came out with a new cookbook pretty recently on uh, Thai cooking. I did. How, yes. How's that it, going? It, it's going really good, and it's in Costco's now, which is awesome. Um, I I think culinary wise, it's my best book yet for sure. Um, I don't know if you don't like yeah, Thai I food, then maybe not. But <laughs> right. if you, you don't like Thai food, then I'm not your friend. <laughs> So, um, yeah, I was able to spend six weeks in Thailand and, and, you know, pretty much really immersed ourselves in not just the food culture, but the culture in general and, um, cooked with all sorts of people from, you know, five-star resort chefs to literally like a self-sustaining village way up in Northern Thailand where they just, there's not a grocery store within, you know, a hundred miles. Um, it was an amazing experience. So I feel like I brought home a really authentic true to Thailand, um, cookbook and, uh, put a ton of work into it. And yeah, the feedback's been awesome so far. So yeah, if you like Thai food, it's, it's definitely just, it's just a legit Thai cuisine book. I don't care if you're paleo or what you are. It's, it's amazing food. So yeah, it's a uh, good stuff. Hopefully <laughs> I may have to force myself to start cooking again, just to try out some of the recipes. Cause I love Thai food. Just, uh, you know, bribe someone to do it for you. Give them the book and say, look, this is what I want you to make for me. <laughs> <laughs> there are ways, you know, to make that's, that happen. That's not a bad or, idea. Or just come visit us and I will gladly cook some Thai food for you. That I, works too. I will definitely do that. Like, be careful making that offer because you know I'm moving back to your general vicinity, right? That is the rumor that I heard. Yeah, I know that's exciting. And um, if Jason knows, I, it's really hard to keep me from cooking and I know that sounds crazy, but I really do love it. It's kind of like my therapy. So, yeah, anytime anyone comes over, they will get a meal cooked for them for sure. So it's 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 a standing invitation whenever you get here. Awesome. So five o'clock every day starting in September. <laughs> Does that work? <laughs> as long as you do the dishes and you entertain my husband, I am game. <laughs> oh, not a problem. I will totally do. I love washing dishes by hand, actually. That's the one thing okay, I miss perfect. about cooking. I've got a big giant sink that is perfect for that. So you are, you are set. <laughs> nice. I will, I will keep that in mind then. So anything else that, you know, we're kind of towards the end of the hour. We got like another five, six minutes. Anybody have any, anything they want to discuss or talk uh, about or I think it, nothing too exciting. We're uh, going to probably see you next. No, at least I think I am. I'm not sure what Sarah schedule is going to be but we're doing our seminar in uh in palo alto or no i'm sorry uh santa rosa next month and uh we're i think at least you and i are gonna and my wife are gonna sit down for a meal that'll be fun yeah yeah looking forward to that um gotta get rocky out there too you only go out there for business right rocky oh uh, sometimes i go for pleasure okay well, yeah we where, need to get where you, are you out at there. where are you at rocky i'm here in phoenix oh okay we're yeah nice not too far of a jaunt it's only like an hour and a half flight yeah, it's nice, say, nice and cool, and there's like a balmy breeze right now, I'm sure. It's supposed to be like 117 today. <laughs> oh okay, you can keep that. Yeah. <laughs> my tor poor dog, he's basically locked inside for 14, 15 hours a day. I feel sorry for him. And sometimes I feel sorry for me. Yeah, because we've right now there in Northern California. But. Yeah, he's, he's a little gassy, so being locked inside with him over the last couple of days has not been fun. <laughs> Sounds like a party. <laughs> awesome. Uh, this podcast just took a turn for the worse. <laughs> We're suddenly talking about dog gas. <laughs> yeah. And he eats very so, paleo, by the way. I gave him like yeah. pancetta every night. His dinner is basically, I don't know, like I think a third of a pound of pancetta with some fish wow. oil and some MCT oil mixed in it and just a little bit of dog food so he gets some uh, like a little fibrous component. 
So he's like the Cadillac of dogs. I was going to say he eats he's better than me. <laughs> yeah, I know. I take longer preparing his food than I prepare food for myself. Oh my god! <laughs> oh, to be your dog. There's dogs <laughs> out vouch, there. Everywhere. I can vouch for this. So. I've seen this in, in real time. <laughs> yeah, Rocky's seen me put his meal, his dinner together before. <laughs> well, you know, you've got to. I know, I, oh, go ahead, Sarah. No, I, say, I get emails from people who ask me like what I cook for my dogs. And I'm like, have you seen my house? I have three boys. I have a husband who eats like a horse and I do not spend time preparing food for my dogs. I'm sorry. They eat really high quality grain free dog food and they get our bones. But no, I'm not. I'm not making <laughs> dinner for my family and then spending another hour cooking for my three dogs. <laughs> it just doesn't happen. Yeah, that would <laughs> that would be too much. It would, put, it would put me over the edge for sure. Definitely. <laughs> Well, and then you've got one more mouth to feed, you know, in a couple months here. So that's just going to really push you. I the know edge. it is. I'm, I'm going to be bald and yeah, stressed <laughs> out. No, no, absolutely not. Like I said, it's the, it is my therapy. I love to cook. So it's all good, but not for the dogs. <laughs> that's too much. Kiefer, Kiefer causes female pattern baldness. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's, yeah. Let's not put that disclaimer on the show. No, that's, that's horrible. That's horrible. <laughs> <laughs> oh man yeah cool well uh any so uh why don't you guys you you've got a a few websites so uh if you want to mention them here at the end of the show and then we'll make sure we get those all listed when the show uh publishes as well to make sure everybody can find you find your books uh you know find what you're doing contact you for help if they need it uh you know any of that that kind of stuff. So we'll start with Sarah. Sure. Go for it, Sarah. Um, well, my site is everyday. Yes. Yeah, sorry. I'm just going to jump in there. Um, so the website is everydaypaleo.com and Jason and I co-own a fitness site together is eplifefit.com. So it's a fitness uh, subscription site. And we also have a podcast together, Paleo Lifestyle and Fitness, which you can find on iTunes. And I think that's it. And then all of our books are on Amazon. Jason is the author of The Paleo Coach. And I have five books that all start with everyday paleo. So they're pretty easy to find. They're all over the website and on Amazon and in Costco. Excellent. The Costco thing coming. is huge. Yeah, it yeah, is. More I feel projects very, very coming lucky all the time too. Costco likes this. Sorry. Yeah. And more projects. Yes. Always more projects coming up because we never rest. I mean, we do rest, but we always keep doing stuff. <laughs> yeah, even so. fun stuff with Kiefer on the way. Yeah. We'll, we'll see how that goes. I, I'm, I'm excited to see what you put together so far. So, um, yep. Yeah, cool, cool stuff already out there. I mean, you guys have a great amount of information that's already there uh, for people to start digging into. And I know some great information is on its way. So definitely two people to watch if you are not already paying attention to them on a religiously dedicated basis. Uh, maybe you should. You, actually, maybe you should pay attention to them more than you do me at times. Um <laughs> Only because they're going to be less offensive than I am in the long run. Um, but but uh, I think, you know, if you guys have any last words, we can we can call this one a wrap. This, this has been a really good show. You know, we've had some great conversations, you know, up and down the the subject line. So any, any last sure. words to sum it up? Well, I'm just grateful for you letting us be on your podcast. Thank you. I know we've enjoyed having you on our show and it's, it's always fun to be on the other side of the mic, I guess, so to speak. So thank you very much. And nice to, nice to be here. So thanks. Thanks to both yeah. of you guys. Thank you very much. Yeah. And, uh, Rocky, it was good to talk with you again. I haven't seen you since paleo FX. Uh, hopefully, uh, hopefully we'll remedy that soon. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks a lot. You two for getting on. I, you know, I know it's hard to coordinate uh, different people in different locations for, for the same time on a podcast. So thanks a lot. Really appreciated having you show on the show. Uh, we'll make sure everybody can find you. We'll get all the links at the end of this show, uh, up on the website. So, um, like I said, people can start checking you out and see what you got if they don't already know. All right, everybody, thanks for being on and thanks for listening. And that's another episode of Body IO FM. You've been listening to Body IO FM with your hosts, Kiefer and Dr. Rocky. If you'd like to hear more, log on to body.io. 
We'll be back next time with more science from the pinnacle of human health and performance.